Thanks for joining us today at City Life. We believe today's message will empower you and point you towards Jesus. But remember that church is so much more than a message you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be a part of. We hope to see you on a Sunday morning at City Life, in person or online. Well, we've been on the series, The Journey, and it has been awesome. I hope you've been encouraged by it. Um, if you're new or visiting, um, you can kind of catch up online. We've got the messages on our, on, on, on our YouTube channel and on our uh, website. And then we've been going through an app that we've, uh, uh, that we've or uh, not an app, uh, what is it? It's a discipleship tool. Thank you. My wife is helping me out here. A discipleship tool called The Journey. And it's a really incredible uh, tool that you can use. Many of you know about it already, but if you don't, uh, you, can, you can actually check it out and um, you go through it with another person, one person at least, if not more. And the purpose is to actually go through the journey of following Jesus together. It's pretty straightforward. Hey, let's follow Jesus. Let's do this together. Cool. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Uh, we had Melissa encouraging us last week specifically about discipleship. And this week, I'm going to be talking about the hard things, the difficult things, the tough stuff. Everyone knows on the journey, most journeys in life, whether they're filled with lots and lots of enjoyment and fun, typically there's hard parts about the journey. If you're going to go up a mountain, who here has gone up a mountain from the base of a mountain before with their feet, not a gondola, like up to the top, from the bottom to the top? Man, that can be hard. That can be difficult. And there's certain spots where you usually get to and you're like, I think I'd like to maybe stop. But so in our Christian journey as well, when we're following Jesus, it's not just all rainbows and sunshine. There's difficult times. We, we have mountaintop moments, but in between the mountaintops, what are there? The valleys. Yes. So that's what we're talking about today. But my goal is to hopefully equip you through God's Word today to handle and deal with this suffering, I guess you could, another word is for it, the suffering of being a Christian. There is suffering that we endure, and all throughout the history of Christians, all the way till today, and then probably until Jesus comes back, there's going to be difficulties, there's going to be struggle, and there's going to be suffering, and we don't want to just put our head in the sand and sit on the sidelines. As Christians, we want to be able to do these seasons well so that we can point to a risen Savior that actually helps us and leads us and guides us. And so, um, no one is immune from difficult times. We know that. And so, today, my goal, I'm, I'm going to be just doing a general conversation for a few moments, just about where we're at as a society, kind of the struggle of life right now. Uh, then I want to talk about a few different, not all the types, but a few major different types of the way people deal with suffering. And then ultimately I want to equip us with God's word. How do we suffer well? So this is like a really sunshiny, happy <laughs> message. So hopefully you can just be pumped up, psyched up, and ready to go. So let's just pray. Father God, we just thank you that your word is true. God, we thank you that from before the foundations of the earth, you were there, God, and you have been there and you will be forevermore, God. So you are our source, you are our life, you are the one that uh, will lead and guide our lives. And so we bring surrendered and humble hearts to you to, to ask that you would teach us and guide us through your Holy Spirit today, through your word and a faith-filled church said together, amen. amen. Okay. Well, as I said, most journeys have difficult parts. There's, there's hard parts in any journey. Um, this was one of my hardest journeys. Now you're going to say it's not too hard, but as a parent. So we had our first child, we had our second child, we had our third child. And the journeys went pretty good when we traveled physically. They went pretty well. Then we had our fourth child. And my son is not, a, he just, from a little baby, he just wasn't a great traveler. And we would even go an hour down the road and there would be like 50 minutes of just screaming and whining and complaining, and it just it was it was difficult at times. It actually was really difficult, and I found myself just wanting to like just pull my hair out. I don't know how 
as a musician and somebody who plays music by ear, I have very sensitive ears, I find, and it just drove me wild, just the, the, the sounds. Um, so, you know, that was a difficult thing for me. Now, I'm not equating that to true suffering for Jesus. I'm just giving you just a, just a small example. It's like, you know, that, that can be difficult. Um, you know, in a, in a journey, this is actually, um, if any of you have sent your kids out to uh, Living Springs Bible Camp, the guy, Jeff Enerson, who's my cousin, who oversees all of it, he's a pretty crazy dude, and he used to drive between here and California all the time, and he'd say, you know what, there's some really tough parts about the journey, and he wouldn't stop, he'd just drive straight, every time, and he said, to keep you awake through the night, spits doesn't work, rolling down the windows doesn't work, air conditioning doesn't work, loud music doesn't work, and he said, you know what works, Jeremy? He takes his big hunting knife, and he drives with it above his leg, about this high, <laughs> If you know Jeff, you'd be like, yeah, that's about right. That's crazy. So I'm not talking about like th that kind of tough stuff with the journey, but I thought it was just kind of funny to mention. I was thinking about that. I'm like, that guy is so crazy. That is crazy. But let's get real for a few moments. The last few years in, in our culture and society, they've been more difficult, I would say, than, say, you know, the previous years. Um, I, would, I would say they were, and maybe if they weren't for you, I'm really happy for you. But for myself, and I think many people in this room and many people listening, they were difficult. There were some difficult times. Would you agree? Yeah, I think, you know, there was, some, there was lots of confusion. There was lots of fear. Uh, I didn't know what was going to happen in the last few years. There was frustration. Um, I felt hopeless. I'm sure you felt hopeless at different times. There was such a polarization of not just just. Uh, one or two things, but so many ideologies and so much polarization began to, like, there's camps that started to establish that just, I found myself saying, like, what is going on? And, and um, you know, and things also got very expensive. Have you noticed that? I have. I'm like, wow, things got really expensive. I used to be able to, be able to meet, eat at McDonald's fairly cheaply. Now God's punishing me if I want to binge there once in a while. $300. Okay. So, you know, things have been difficult, and relationships, I find, have been really strained as well. Not all relationships, but, but families being torn apart, um, good friends being torn apart based on, you know, just the difficulties that we've gone through. And as Christians as well, I think it's been difficult um, for a long time, uh, I, would say, I would say, in our Western culture, to have a Christian belief, that wasn't, that was like, oh, good for you. It's like what a lot of people kind of held loosely, even if they didn't follow Jesus, people would hold loosely to the morals of the Christian faith. Not completely, but they would. And now, if you are a historical Christian, someone who follows historical Christianity, those ideologies are not very accepted these days. And so there's, it's a difficult, and I think it will become more and more difficult to be a Christian that follows Jesus and his word in our society. It's, it's, it's becoming m more difficult. You know, will we in, in North America be beaten and imprisoned for our faith? Well, I really hope not. I ha I'm not really seeing that like you would see in other places in the world or where you could potentially be executed for having a faith in Christ. So we're not experiencing that kind of persecution or suffering. But, you know, we have all sorts of difficulty socially and, and in the church world. And then also there's physical challenges. Our food has gotten way worse in the last 20, 30, 40 years. So physical ailments in people's bodies, um, the unhealthiness of our society, and I'm not trying to bring us right down to the ground and crash us, but ultimately I'm just trying to talk about reality. The way the internet has changed things. I was, I've been in a mall I think four times since I was in West Edmonton Mall when we oversaw uh, our service. Uh, uh, we had an extension service there. And so I've hardly been in a mall, and we were in a mall for our anniversary, Jen and I, just the other day. And I always make it a practice, if I'm in a public place, I don't try to pull my phone out ever. And I felt like just a weirdo, because I was waiting for Jennifer, she was just in a store taking care of something, and I was in another store, and then we we're going to meet up. And so I was just waiting, I was waiting early, and so easy to just pull out the phone. And right now, like, people's attention spans are just like, they don't even exist, I don't think, hardly at all. And so, you know, we're facing all sorts of challenges, and um, it's, it's not easy, necessarily. But here's the deal. As humans, we want it easy, don't we? Doesn't it just, doesn't it feel good when things are just easy? 
they do feel good. I love it, actually. It's like, oh, that was easy. When you have an expectation of something being really hard, and it's like, oh, that was, that was really easy. And I find, at least for myself, a huge dopamine person. I'm looking for dopamine hits all the time, and I have to combat that through all sorts of things. I'm looking for easy. I'm looking for simple. I don't want to suffer. Who in the world wants to suffer? I don't think, you know, there's a few guys like David Goggins or like a few people out there that, I think that's his name. The, anyways, you probably don't know. Anyways, this guy, I won't go into who he is, but there's a few select people out there that are just like, bring on the suffering. Like, I strive and for suffering in life. It's amazing. Most of us want the easy way, don't we? And here's the second thing that I think the church sometimes hasn't done a great job at. As Christians, in the back of our mind, we, we have this mentality or we can have this mentality that says things should be easy because I'm a Christian. And I don't know if you believe that. I, I, you have the, because, you know, first of all, we have forgiveness of sins. Christ has forgiven us of all of our sins. We're now found righteous before God. We get wisdom from the Holy Spirit when we ask. And, you know, we actually have the resurrection power, the same power that was exerted to raise, raise Christ from the dead is alive in us. So, you know, you can, you can hear these, these, these teachings which are true. The fact is all those things are actually true. But we have this mentality that's like, because I'm a Christian, life should be awesome. And I should experience blessing at all times, and I shouldn't suffer. Well, that's just not true. Should we experience blessing? Yes, we should. Do we experience just incredible uh, freedom from our sin? We do. But yet we are still in a broken and trapped world. So this is uh, a world that, I shouldn't say a trapped world, a world that sin is still prevalent. Christ has, has defeated the grave, but yet there is an enemy, the Bible talks about, that roams around like a lion looking to devour. So there's kind of this catch where we get stuck in these, in, in these hard areas. Well, let's look at Jesus' words here and what he actually says about suffering. This is going to be super encouraging, you guys. John 16, I have told you these things. He's talking to his disciples. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Okay, I would like peace. I'm sure everyone here would like peace. Uh, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Oh, great. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So are you encouraged? Are you ready to go? <laughs> I don't know if you are. I want to take the next few moments and just talk about... Uh, the different kinds of suffering that people can endure and the different types of people uh, and the way they handle suffering, okay? So these are just, I've got four different categories. This is not all the types, but I want to just hopefully, hopefully you can, can identify with, with at least one of these. And so there's four general categories of suffering. And so the first one is those who are afflicted by the devil. Greetings and salutations. Number one, those who are afflicted by the devil. Well, what do you mean by that? Now, if you've read the Bible at all, especially in the Old Testament where there's Job, if you've read the book of Job, here is a righteous man, a man who is following God with his whole heart. He's not a perfect man, but he is doing everything in his mind, body, and spirit to follow God. And, the, and Satan actually attacks him, and Job loses absolutely everything. All his family dies all of his business is taken from him. And, and his physical life is hanging on by a thread. Physically, his health is taken down to, he probably, if, if you're going battery, like battery level, he's down to like that 1% where it's like flashing at you, physically. That wasn't because Job was like, oh, you're a dirty sinner there, Job, and this is the repercussions. No, that wasn't it. He was a righteous man that, that the devil just attacked him. He lost everything, yet he trusted God. Now, sometimes, you know, the, sometimes the devil, devil will come after, after you and try to scare you. He'll try to intimidate you. He's going to try to stop you and say, I don't want you to advance in God's purposes and plans for your life. But yet, 
you didn't do anything. You're a righteous person. Again, not a perfect person, but a person that's saying, I am pursuing God. I am trusting him. him. I'm not deliberate, deliberately trying to sin. I'm trusting in God. And Job had every right to get angry at God and curse him out, but he didn't. And so um, that's the first one. You might be under an actual demonic attack. J.D. preached a pretty incredible message, I don't know how long ago, three, four months ago-ish, about the demonic, and you should go listen to that. It's actually quite good. Number two, uh, those who are persecuted by others. So you're persecuted by others. Others who do not believe in Jesus. You believe and follow follow Jesus, and you are persecuted because you believe in Jesus by others who do not. Um, Now, the Apostle Paul is actually a really good example of this. If you, if you know the story of Paul, he, prior to being Paul, his name was Saul. He was the Jew of all Jew, he writes about himself. He followed every Jewish practice, and he hated and despised Christians with every ounce of his body, and he issued the killing and approved the killing of Christians. So this is who Saul is. So Saul is actually persecuting Christians. Then while he's on his his way, minding his own business, Jesus physically appears to, to him, blinds him, and Saul recognizes his foes, realizes that Jesus is Lord, and the persecutor now becomes the persecuted, and he surrenders his life to Jesus, and becomes a Christian, the very people that he was murdering. And now Saul, if, I mean, Saul who became Paul, he goes, it's actually crazy what actually begins to happen with his life. Here's a short little list. He writes here in Acts 20, 23, it says, he says, the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. Great. He's kidnapped. He's beaten. He's threatened, arrested many times, accused in lawsuits. He's interrogated. He's ridiculed, shipwrecked, and bitten by a viper. It's like, come on, did the viper really need to bite him? But he did. But overall, not the whole list, but the, the majority of the list is there's other people saying, I am going to make you suffer because you love Jesus. And you know, we may face that as well, and I think it may increase in our, our lifetime as well. To say that I love Jesus and I follow his ways and his teachings, that's going to become potentially more controversial. So it doesn't sound very comforting to me. Um, Number three, third type of person is those who live by excuses. Do you know a person that for almost everything, they always have an excuse or often have an excuse? It's kind of exhausting, isn't it? It's never my fault. It's always someone or something that, that caused the situation. It wasn't me. It was them. It was this. This is John 5, 1 to 15. Uh, it's actually not all the way to 1 to 15. But I'm going to read a section of, this is a, this is a story when Jesus was physically on the earth. It says, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there, uh, now there, is, a, uh, yeah. now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was, uh, one who was there had been, uh, had been there for 38 years. That's quite a long time. When Jesus saw him laying there uh, and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one uh, to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. Why am I trying to get in? Uh, Sorry, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat, and he walked. Here's a man who did have a serious condition. I'm not minimizing the seriousness, seriousness of his condition, but he still was laying there in his excuses. He says, no one is here to help me. After 38 years, you couldn't get one person to help you? I know that sounds extreme, but some of us, and I know for myself at times, sit in excuses and just say, ah, well, 
I'm just going to come up with this list and this list, and God can't because of this, and I did this, and so on and so forth. So that's the third type of person. And then the fourth one is those who are paralyzed, okay? Many of you would know the story uh, in Luke uh, 5, 18 to 25. I'll read it here just quickly. It says, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to, uh, to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. It's pretty cool, pretty awesome friends. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. It goes on and he tells eventually uh, the man is physically healed as well. But the, here's, a, here's a person is, who is actually suffering so bad they're physically paralyzed. Okay? They can't... They can't do anything about it. And I know for, for, for some people, there are certain ailments, there are certain things physically in your body or in your life where you cannot do anything about. In the natural circumstance, there is nothing you can do about it. You investigated every avenue, and there is nothing that you can do. But look what happens here. It's the faith of the friends that came along. They said, oh, we know what to do. We need to get this person to Jesus. And so... And this is an encouragement, actually, to, to us all. Do we have people in our world where we are bringing to, in prayer to the feet of Jesus and saying, hey, I can bring this person. They, they have nothing left. They, are, they, are, they might be paralyzed spiritually as well. It could be metaphorical as well. I think that's the word, metaphorical, maybe. Is that, does that work? Yeah, okay. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm very bad with the English language. But ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, there are people who are, who are stuck and they have actual, actually no hope in life. And they're waiting for others to bring them to the feet of Jesus. So with my remaining time, I just want to go through five quick ways that the Bible teaches us how to handle suffering. Okay? Does that work for you? Man, the time goes so dang quick. That was a nice whistle. All right, uh, five things that the Bible teaches us about suffering. So this is where, this is our application. This is where we can take, take what the Bible is saying and move forward with this. Because if you're not suffering now, you're going to start suffering soon. It's just life. And I'm sorry to be that person to say that, but I'd rather give you the tools as opposed to like, hey, go on this journey and it's going to rain the whole time and not give them like a rain jacket and an umbrella or something. Here's your rain jacket and umbrella for the trip. Number one is rejoice in suffering. Oh, let's just start it off with joy. Rejoice in suffering. The Bible teaches that suffering can lead to growth and a deeper reliance on God. It's like, oh, great. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. What a bizarre statement. We rejoice in our sufferings, but let's find out why. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So do you see what's happening here? There's a refining process. You don't have hope, and you don't have character, but as you begin to rejoice... Endurance starts to build up. Endurance is leading to character. Character is leading to hope. And then you're filled with hope in a really ridiculous, wretched, horrible situation. You can actually rejoice as a follower of Jesus in difficult, really hard places. You can do it. And the reason we can rejoice is because God's love has been poured into our hearts, the scripture says. And there is nothing that can steal that joy. It's not just try to be happy. No, it's not that. It's experiencing the love of God continuing to fill your life over and over and over and over and again, and you begin to overflow with rejoicing. That's why disciples, when they were put in prison, could sing psalms and spiritual hymns to God while in physical chains. They had understood that re reality. The second thing that the Bible teaches, uh, teaches us about suffering is to have endurance and perseverance. Now, we slightly talked about that just before, but check this out in James 1, 2 to 4. Consider it a pure joy. These scriptures really kind of go together. A pure joy? Okay. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, that perseverance finish its work so that you, be, you may be mature 
and complete, not lacking anything. When we suffer, we are actually maturing and working towards the completed version that God has for us. It's kind of like hard to get your mind around that. Does God just say, take the suffering, I'm, I'm causing the suffering? I do not believe that God does that. But in this broken and lost world, God can redeem these situations and cause our character to grow and for us to mature and to become actually complete, the Bible says, which is awesome. And again, we have to mention, consider it a pure joy. We should be the happiest people on this planet, church. We should be. The third thing the Bible teaches us about suffering is, uh, is, know where our car, uh, is to know where our comfort actually comes from. We actually, we actually have to know where our comfort comes from. As I mentioned, being a person that is always looking for that dopamine hit, that stuff doesn't last very long. And then you're just looking for another one and another one and another one. It just doesn't work. God is our source. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4 says, blessed, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, not just some comfort, all comfort, who comforts us in any affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by. I know there's a lot of snuggling and comforting going on there, but ultimately, God is the God of all comfort. He gives us comfort. Then we receive that comfort and give it to others who are also suffering. That's good. So if you're suffering right now, receive the comfort that comes from God. Position yourself in prayer, in worship, and saying, God, I am suffering right now. Would you comfort my heart? I, I desire for you to be the only one that brings true comfort to me. He is the true source. Not just another good meal and not just some, another good sports game or shopping spree or enter entertainment here or there. That's not the source. Number four, the fourth thing that the Bible teaches us about suffering is about our hope and our eternal perspective. Our hope and our eternal perspective. Romans 8, 18 says, For I, this is Paul, the, the one who was shipwrecked and bit by the viper and beat up and condemned, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. If you imagine a tiny little light that you could, imagine if this room was completely dark and you had just like the smallest light, you'd be able to see it. But imagine here in Alberta, we all know what I'm going to, what I'm referring to when, say you've got just the jacked up truck. And you, know, you know where I'm going with this, with like 900 light bars across the front. And it's just dropping down the highway, just That's the difference in light, and then times it by a million. He sees the sufferings as this tiny little inconvenience compared to the glory that he will inherit. I'm going to invite the team to come up here right away, and we're going to take a moment to, to worship and sing in just a few moments, but I'll give us the fifth point and then, and then uh, just encourage us. The, the fifth thing that the Bible teaches us about suffering is about prayer and community teaches us about prayer and community. James 5, uh, 13 says, is any among you suffering? Well, let him pray. That's the response. It's not, go complain to your friends or just try to buy some more stuff off Amazon to fill that, or whatever. It's just, it's no, let him pray. If anyone's among you suffering, let him pray. Galatians 6, 1 to 2 says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves, or you, uh, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will, be, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. We are meant, we are meant to be people of prayer. If we are gonna, when we are suffering, we turn to God. And if you're suffering, there is no shame in coming to a trusted you know, friend that you're doing the journey with or a pastor or someone, a spiritual leader in your life, there is no shame. It's actually highly acceptable 
to go to that person and say, I'm really struggling here. Can you pray for me? Yes, yes, I can. And that person who, that person, it says in Galatians 6 again, in verse 2, uh, carry each other's burdens. If you are not in a season potentially of suffering, carry each other's burdens. You can do that. That's what this journey is about. It's not about just us. Okay, well, Jesus and I are good. My life is good. Cool. That's actually not what the church is. It's not about an I, it's about a we. We are the church. A body isn't one body part. That's weird. If it was just a finger, like going around, or a hand, like on, what is that? Wednesday? There you go. That's weird. I got to say, that's weird, man. It's not very effective. Through prayer and practicing community, we do this journey together. God, we thank you that when we come to Jesus, he makes everything new. God, we thank you that in Christ is found fullness of joy. In Christ is found fullness of life, forgiveness of sins, and a bright future ahead. Not a future void of suffering, God, but a future full of your presence that far outweighs these temporary struggles that, that, we, that we struggle with, God. And God, we don't just minimize our problems, but we magnify you. And we acknowledge that you are the one that is bigger and greater and stronger and reigns above all else. And so church, in just an attitude of prayer right now, as we continue uh, in an attitude of worship as well, I want to lead each and every one of us to the place of surrender. Now, I cannot make you surrender to Jesus. That's not how any of that works. It's ultimately you as an individual saying, I do. I do want to surrender my life to Jesus. And it's an acknowledgement, first and foremost, that you are actually a sinner. That's not a popular word to say, but it's the real thing to say, and I'd rather be real than popular. And ultimately, each one of us carries sin in our own lives. And it is Christ and Christ alone that can remove the burden, the weight, and the penalty for sin. He is the only one that can do that. And as we acknowledge as Christians, or as people, or Christians, but as people, that I am a sinner and that I repent for going my own way. And God, I give up my own way. And now I want to follow you and go your way. That's the starting point of surrender. And then it's a continued journey as an individual and as a church of following Jesus together and working that out. And so I just want to lead us all in a prayer of surrender. And I think... It's something that we can do on a daily basis. And so it can be just, this can be a moment for every person in this room and every person listening online to just say, put a stake in the ground, say, this was a moment again, maybe for the first time or again, where I'm just saying, I surrender to you, Jesus, and your ways and your leadership and your lordship over my life. And so just want to invite you. You don't have to put up a hand or anything. That's just all of us. We're going to pray that. And if you want to actually pray that prayer for real, you don't have to. I'm not going to force anyone. If you want to pray that prayer for real, you can just say it out loud. There'll be many people in this room who are going to be saying this out loud. You can just repeat it after me. And so let's surrender our lives to Jesus. And let's just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I acknowledge that you are the Savior and that you rule and reign. I also acknowledge that I am a sinner. And I come to you with a repentant heart. And I say sorry. And I bring surrender to you. I ask that you would lead me, guide me, forgive me, and fill me with the love of the Father. I thank you that from this day and this moment, I am a Christian and I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's just give God praise one more time. 
We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc slash next step or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor to play a small part in what God is doing in your life. We look forward to connecting with you soon.